Dean Deska, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, friends. Thank you very much for coming to listen to an old professor talk to you about uh, one of his favorite subjects, which is Africa. Uh, thank you also for that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, I always say very briefly that um, uh, my career is best described as um, a teacher by training, but a diplomat by accident. Very prolonged accident, no doubt, <laughs> but still an accident because the uh, Excellency, the High Commissioner of Nigeria is here. He knows that uh, I'm one of the people called non-career ambassadors, uh, although the, the line between career and non-career in my case is a bit uh, thin. But it's really a pleasure to be in Singapore and to have been invited uh, by the RSIS to spend six months um, to reflect uh, on some of the things I've done uh, in the last uh, 23 years or so because uh, in the last 23 years I've been, um, as uh, the dean described, a practitioner uh, of uh, foreign affairs as ambassador of my country but also uh, working for the United Nations uh, itself. Uh, and I haven't had really time to reflect on what does this all mean, what are the priorities, and also, frankly, to help prepare me for my next uh, uh, stage, the next stage of my life, which is what I want to do uh, next. I must say that one of the reasons I've been out very long outside of my country has very little to do with my competence, although I'm flattered that some people think it is, but the fact that the Nigerians haven't figured out what to do with me back in Nigeria. <laughs> so, so as you can see, <laughs> I'm still out. <laughs> um, I'm still out. Now, the topic that uh, I have chosen today, and I want to thank uh, RSIS for indulging me uh, in, uh, in the choice of the, of the topic, uh, is beyond its mineral and natural resources, why Africa matters to the world. Now, although trends do not neatly fit into decades, it's a fair observation that if you look at the first decade of independence for most African countries, that is, say, from the 1960s uh, to 70s, that was one largely of hopes, great excitement, and enormous expectations. The expectations were that self-governance in Africa will actually produce good governance and that independence will usher in economic growth, higher standard of living, as well as overall development. Two things capture this spirit, in my view. The first was uh, the famous statement credited to the late President Kwame Nkrumah of uh, Ghana when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom, uh, the political kingdom, and everything else will follow. In other words, what matters? Just get that independence. Everything else will be, will be fine. And in my own country, one of the major political parties in the country, the action group it was called, uh, the motto for this party was life more abundant for all the people. So the expectation was that will independence will come life more abundant for the people, and that once you become free, everything else will fall into place. Now, unfortunately, in the almost two succeeding decades, disillusionment soon followed, as African countries experienced military coup d'etat, poor governance, civil wars, low commodity prices, unfavorable external times of trade, growing external indebtedness, uh, drought, and famine. Indeed, for the two decades following Africa's decolonization, the continent was in the media almost exclusively for its woes and crises. At the international level, it seemed Africa had little or no effective voice. Factors that contributed to the continent's international marginalization ranged from its political and economic weaknesses and lack of competitiveness in the world, and also the debilitating effects of HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. For decades, therefore, international financial exports, uh, uh, experts and development practitioners designed and attempted to apply different concepts uh, in efforts to develop Africa's market and to open them to the global market. However, contrary to their predictions and hopes, Africa's continue to suffer from stagnant economic growth coupled with high unemployment and inflationary pressures. In fact, this period could be considered as a period of Afro-pessimism. And in large part, <coughs> as I said, because prescriptions were always from outside, you know, IMF, World Bank, 
all kinds of prescription. And I must share with you <coughs> an experience I had. I attended um, an international conference on federalism in this period. And uh, there was a young scholar, which is typical of most young scholars. I know there are quite a number in the audience. He said, uh, who happened to be, uh, I think it, it was uh, uh, British or German. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. He said to me, Mr. Gambari, I understand you are from Nigeria. I said, yes, I am. Uh, I have uh, a solution for all the political problems in Nigeria. So I said, you do? Uh, he said, yes, the best constitution for Nigeria that will bring peace and security is to have the Swiss constitution. Because the Swiss had three major groups, the, the French, the Germans, and the Italians. And they have cantons, which are strong and a very weak central government. He said, that's the ideal constitution for Nigeria, because you have three major tribes or ethnic groups, Igbos, Yorubas, and, uh, and Hausas. <coughs> and I said, you know, I agree with you entirely. The best constitution for Nigeria would be the, the Swiss model. But one condition. You have to take all the Nigerians away from Nigeria in order for the Swiss constitution to work in Nigeria. <laughs> Just replace them with, this, with the Swiss, <coughs> and then everything will be fine. So you see the <laughs> danger of this prescription externally is that they are designed by and for other uh, uh, countries, other society, other situations that may have little or no bearing to the African situation. And I believe that that era of African pessimism will have continued, but for the fact that the Africans decided enough was enough and they have to take um, uh, their self-determination very seriously again and define solutions to their problems. And I will have therefore say that uh, from this Afro-pessimism, a new era of Afro-enthusiasm began. With the end of the Cold War and the global pressures for open societies, demand for human rights and democratization, Africa was entering in the following two decades a new phase of political maturity and development. This period witnessed the end of colonialism and apartheid in Africa. I was the last chairman, one of the things I'm most proud of, I was the last chairman of the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid. And I was privileged to hand Mandela uh, a letter of congratulations <coughs> um, as president uh, of uh, the new non-racial democratic South Africa as a representative of both the Security Council by some coincidence and also of the Special Committee Against Apartheid. Interestingly enough, by the way, I was invited because this, uh, Mandela's inauguration was planned by the previous regime. And they did not want to invite me as chairman of the Special Committee Against Apartheid. Because for them, um, the special committee was not against apartheid, it was against South Africa. And I had to say, no, no, it was not special committee against apartheid, but against apartheid. In any case, uh, they found a good excuse that I was at that time also president of the Security Council, and uh, I was able to uh, present uh, Mandela with that uh, letter of congratulations. Um, so that was <laughs> colonialism ended, the Africans have survived, apartheid ended, the Africans have survived, and they were beginning to make transition gradually from military rule and one-party state structures in civilian and um, multi-party democracies. And one illustration of that change is that as we speak, as we speak, I don't believe I may be wrong that a single country in Africa that is now currently headed by military rule. Now, remember that in the previous uh, decades that I mentioned, more than 60%, including my own country, uh, were ruled by the military and for a prolonged uh, time. In fact, there's uh, now in the African Union um, a provision that if you change, if any country, any member state changes its uh, government, other than by constitution means, guess what will happen to you? You are thrown out of the African family. I don't know of any other regional organization that will have that in its statutes, that you, you change your government other than by non-constitutional means, you are out of the family. And not just theory. They did it for Madagascar, Mauritania, Mauritius, Guinea, uh, and it may also be a, a signal to uh, some other countries, uh, including maybe my own, Nigeria, that uh, for the minute, not even think about changing, uh, taking over the government because the consequences will be immediate and, uh, and swift. For example, God forbid, if the military were to take over in Nigeria now, Nigeria will be immediately suspended from ECOWAS, from which is a member, and where the capital is in, in, in Abuja, and from the, uh, the African Union, which will be inconceivable for most uh, patriotic Nigerians. I would also suggest that, coincidentally, the first decade of the new millennium 
also mark the turn for Africa's economic woes to, in, to go in the right direction. Africa witnessed an uptown in economic growth that is far more than a passing phenomenon. From 2000 to 2010, its average growth rate was above 5%. Some countries in Africa even showed double-digit growth. And according to the most recent study by the World Bank, which was produced, I think, only last week, overall, the region is forecast to grow more than 5% on average uh, between now and the 2050. So it's not just a passive phenomenon. It seems as if, in fact, that trend of growth will continue for the next uh, few years. Now, initially, Africa's growth boom was caused by rising commodity prices. Africa is estimated to have about 12% of the world's oil and 40% of the world's gold reserves, as well as vast arable land and forest resources. However, while African countries were also affected by the world economic and financial crisis in 2008, they were quick in bouncing back and returning to their pre-crisis uh, growth rates. Africa's middle class is also gaining ground. Today, spending in African households is believed to be more than double, uh, more than that in India and Russia. With Lagos, the capital, I mean the financial capital, the commercial capital of Nigeria being a larger consumer market than Mumbai. The rule of law and respect for private property rights is spreading along with improvements in the financial sector. The telecommunications revolution in Africa and its IT innovation have equally made a great contribution to growth and development in Africa. These changes have lifted Africa out of an era of Afro-pessimism, which I've briefly described, into possibly a new era of uh, Afro-enthusiasm. Yet, it's fair to say that multiple challenges remain, which threaten to undermine the progress already achieved. This include the surge in terrorist uh, activities from Mali in the Sahel, uh, West Afri Western Africa, all the way to Somalia in the Horn of Africa. Continuing violent conflict and insecurity in some other countries and regions in Africa. Environmental degradation threatening the livelihoods of millions of farmers and cattle herders, as well as staple food supplies for millions of people, uh, even more. Then poverty and unequal distribution of wealth is, uh, is a challenge. Food insecurity, weak governance systems, youth unemployment, disparities in gender and political, economic, uh, and economic governance. African leaders have, however, recognized and repeatedly stressed the urgent need to resolve these issues and to advance in efforts towards lasting prosperity for all the peoples of Africa. So what I intend to do uh, is just to very briefly mention some of these challenges and what the Africans themselves have taken the lead in trying to address. Because I believe that these challenges also carry potentialities, not only for Africa, but for the world as a whole. Because global efforts to contain transnational security threats or alleviate the impact of climate change can only be successful if Africa is fully included in the planning and in the implementation of these strategies to overcome these challenges. Addressing the root causes of people converging towards terrorist activities in Africa would have a great impact on the security and stability of Europe and of North America, for example. In this regard, Africa cannot and should not be viewed only as a recipient of strategies that are formulated elsewhere. Rather, the continent has to be involved in the formulation and the design uh, of, uh, of solutions to this conflict. I recall that, again, as ambassador of my country, I remember the heady days of uh, demand for new world order. Uh, following the uh, American victory in the first Gulf War. And uh, my president then said, yes, there's, there should be a new world order, but it should be collectively defined, collectively designed, and collectively implemented. Collectively defined, collectively designed, and collectively implemented. Uh, because that's the only way in which you have a true global order. Now, I have to say, however, from experience, which I want to share with you, that uh, there's a tendency, including on the, in the part of the UN, to regard Africa as if it's just uh, a recipient of international uh, aid and, uh, and development, it's a recipient, a consumer of international peace and security, but I want to tell you it ain't so. Because 
Africa has also contributed enormously to the um, uh, development of concepts in, in, in for peace and security. Uh, they have participated in international peace and security. They have contributed human resources uh, in significant ways uh, to the pursuit of world peace and security. And I would like to mention uh, some of them. Um, for example, African countries continue to provide substantial support to peacekeeping across the globe as troop and police contributing countries in and in provision of civilian staff. Uh, for example, national personnel who are recruited in peacekeeping missions across Africa provide invaluable substantive local knowledge without which most operations will be absolutely ineffective. Several contingents and civilian staff serve in high-risk environment where they live, often in very precarious, uh, uh, precarious conditions, and even die. I myself came almost directly from El Fasha in Darfur to Singapore. Imagine the transition. Um, believe me, you wouldn't want to live in El Fasha if you can afford, avoid it. Um, it's a city, capital of Darfur, <coughs> almost a million people, one restaurant. So you can imagine when I came to Singapore, I've been feeding myself <laughs> 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 to make up for, <laughs> for two years, seven months. And in fact, I always say I, I was in a fashion for two years, seven months, uh, uh, five days, um, uh, 15 hours and, uh, and, and 30 seconds. <laughs> and people say, how are you so exact? Said, because, well, if you live there, you'll be counting the seconds, you know. But, uh, but um, over 16,000 troops, most of them Africans, who are serving in Darfur, because they realize that unless they took the security, their own security in their own hands, the international community is not likely to come in. And which has been shown in Liberia. There will be no country called Liberia and Sierra Leone today, but for the fact that the Africans in West Africa through ECOWAS, through ECOMOG, went there and served and got killed. You can quote me, in the year 1999, January, one month, Nigeria lost 800 soldiers in Sierra Leone. 800. This figure is not even publicized in Nigeria because it will have you know, caused a lot of problems. And also, in the same way, we are lucky that we had a military regime because if a civilian regime lost 800 soldiers in one month, that, that government may have fallen in a democratic uh, setting. Not to count the billions that the Nigerians and, and West Africans have also uh, uh, spent. So what happens is when the Africans themselves take the initiative, you know, contribute troops, serve, get killed, then the international community comes and takes over. Now you have a peacekeeping mission. You had in Sierra Leone it's ended. You had in Liberia is uh, 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 still there, Cote d'Ivoire, and I've already mentioned uh, that for. And guess what? In Somalia. Which, who are the troops that are fighting and dying, fighting at Shabab in, uh, in Mogadishu and elsewhere? Uh, the African troops, the African troops. So they are not just, my point is that Africans are not just consumers of international peace and security, they are contributing with, uh, with their lives, with their personnel. It is true uh, that they don't pay, uh, that the financial uh, cost of these international peacekeeping are more borne by the uh, wealthier countries. And I recall the, um, in Darfur, um, the um, European Union uh, special representative always tells me, Mr. Gambari, remember, the European Union is paying 40% of the budget of your, uh, of your peacekeeping missions. And of course, the Americans pay about between 22, 20 to 22% of all global peacekeeping operations in the world, you know, which is appreciated. But you can't put a dollar value on lives. And this is what the Africans are contributing, and they are showing that they are willing to lay their lives online in order to, to do peacekeeping, which, which contributes. Because believe me, if al Shabaab is not checked, if uh, the terrorist activity in Mali is not checked, the, the losers will not just be Africans, but the rest of the world. Because we know the network of terrorist organization is very fast. Then also, Africans have contributed personnel to um, international organizations, uh, the UN, I mean, Kofi Annan was two times Secretary General of the UN. You had uh, Boutros Ghali, who was uh, the first Secretary General from the African continent. Uh, several under Secretary General, including yours truly. Um, so, 
president of the World Cup, president of General Assembly, president of Security Council. So the point I'm arguing that Africa is important, not just as a recipient of what the international community has to offer, but it's also given in many ways uh, back. And, uh, and in terms of doctrines too, if you look at the, um, the 1969 OU Refugee Con uh, uh, Convention, OU is the Organization of African Unity, the predecessor to the current African Union. It was adopted uh, and it's become the, the, those concepts that the Africans have contributed about the responsibility of those countries that uh, receive refugees. The, the concept of internally displaced persons, you know, uh, all these are concepts that the Africans have contributed to the discourse in terms of people who suffer the distress. Incidentally, one of the worst things that can ever happen to anybody is to be an internally displaced person. I know, sitting in Singapore, can't think of it, you know. But the worst thing, because if you are a refugee, it's very bad, but you are outside your country, and there are laws and regulations on how you should be treated by the host countries. There is a whole international organization, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. But if you are internally displaced, who is to help you except handouts from NGOs and international aid agencies? No rules, no regulation. And in therefore, uh, when I took over, there were two million internally displaced persons out of uh, a population of just about seven, uh, seven million. So Africa's contributions, in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, philosophy, is very important and has to be recognized. Similarly, I think I mentioned the transnational security threats, which has to be addressed uh, globally. Um, now, you may not, from if you look at the newspaper, you will not realize that actually, Africa is a lot more stable now than ever before. Uh, because you only hear, you hear now Somalia. You hear even Boko Haram in Nigeria. Um, Mali, but there are 53 African countries, 53, 53. Okay. Yes, there are threats, there are insecurity, but for the most part, most of the conflict situation in Africa is, is being ended. Sierra Leone, Liberia, Burundi, Rwanda, um, even Nigeria that's in the news, they, they had a, a horrendous civil war called the Biafran Civil War is called. 1966 to 70. Guess what? Guess what? There's nobody with all the problems the country has. Nobody is talking about a return to civil war. Whereas 50% of almost all civil wars end the return to war. As a matter of fact, the leader of the, uh, the rebellion Biafra is dead now. Bless his soul. May his soul rest in peace. He actually contested to be president of Nigeria. He returned. You know? So, you know, don't look at only what grabs the headlines. Look at the fact that substantially most of African countries are at peace. And you look at South Sudan. Look at South Sudan. People were celebrating that, oh, yes, yeah, South Sudan is free, you know. Uh, that was in, um, I think, 9th of July uh, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, almost, uh, it's getting to be, what, uh, two years now. Many of us were very sad. The war in Sudan took millions of lives a lot of internally displaced refugees, but, and they signed a comprehensive peace agreement which gave the people of South Sudan the right of self-determination, which they exercised. There was a referendum. And they chose in almost the Soviet era um, figures, 98.9% was for uh, separation. But that's their right. And they exercised it, and they became independent. But it's sad for many of us who are Pan-Africanists because we feel that Yes, there is potential South Sudan in almost every major African country. Is the solution going to be separation? How many countries do you want to have from Africa? 100? 150? So the solution should not be just what is the easiest, which is separation, but really how to make these artificial entities that we inherited from the colonial powers, how to make them work. Uh, because it can work. And for the most part, if you recall, in 1964, the African leaders in the then Organization of African Unity agreed that however artificial these colonial boundaries are in Africa, we should accept them. Anyway, how many nations are really not artificial in the world? Think about it, right? How many? Right. Except maybe some island states, right? But in any case, we should and work to, to make them work. 
to make them work, all right? And for the most part, that 1964 principle has been respected. There has only been two exceptions, South Sudan and, uh, and can anybody, anybody knows what the second example is? Eritrea. Eritrea. And that was by consent between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. They are cousins in, in many ways. So those are the exceptions that prove the rule about mm -hmm. separation, the exceptions that prove the rule. But nonetheless, it cannot be, the, 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 the security challenge of Africa should not be minimized. And that's why the Africans themselves establish uh, what they call APSA, uh, African Peace and Security Architecture. So at the top of it is the Peace and Security Council. Unlike the UN Peace and Security Council, is egalitarian. There are no veto-wielding members, which is a plus, but also sometimes a minus. You know why it's a minus? Because when a crisis comes, there are no automatic, like the P5, you know, in the US, uh, in, the, in the Security Council, United States, China, Russia, um, France, and UK, that come together instinctively to try to lead in finding a solution. There's no such thing. But at least they have it. Okay. They have deployed troops, as I mentioned, in Darfur, in, um, in, uh, they have also in, in Somalia, and they have a very distinctive African character thing, which uh, you won't, I, don't, I don't know if there is in any other continent, maybe there is. They have a panel of the wise, because Africans believe that with age comes experience and wisdom. You know, that's why you have somebody like, uh, in Yerere is called Mualimu, who is the teacher. You know, um, um, people like Mandela are seen as, uh, as um, you know, Madiba, you know, the, the wise one. So they have a council of the wise, people who are no longer in government, who can think straight, who, you know, and uh, no, no political debt to pay at that stage, and they are asked to come and talk and, and, and see how Africa can uh, deal with his problems of peace and security and, 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 also uh, try to resolve all the conflicts in the, in the continent. It was so successful that they've now decided that there should be, it should be not just the African Union panel of the wise as part of that architecture, but look at each of the regions. They should have their own regional, their, they have their regional uh, organization. They should establish their own panel of the wise. So you have the African Union at the continental level, you have the, at the regional level, panel of the wise, and they've just, last week, Establish what they call Pan Wise, Pan African uh, Panel of the of the Wise. Now, climate change that's very serious for Africa, and again must not be left to the Africans alone. You know, uh, desertification uh, is a problem, um, deforestation is a problem. Um, again, yes, the Africans are taking the initiative, but they should not be. It should not be just an African. Um, a problem. It's not uh, Africa, but it's a global problem. And if you want to find global solutions to global problems, then you have to involve the Africans in a very serious way. Similarly, addressing issue of poverty and inequality is a real challenge. But we also know that with the challenge goes opportunity because the more and more Af uh, Africans are lifted out of poverty, they may be the last frontier you know, for possible consumers. And it's already happening in, in, in many parts of Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, where by reducing poverty, and there's a lot of uh, efforts being made on the continent, it's still a long way. You are uh, then adding people more to possible uh, consumers for, for manufactured goods within Africa, but also outside of, uh, of Africa. Now, there's another area that is uh, very interesting, and you will not normally think of it. In fact, political scientists like to avoid it, and it's, the, and it's about world religion. Africa plays a great grown role for the practice of world religions, especially Islam and Christianity. And this can be used as a, f a factor for unity, uh, but also can be a challenge. And the link between Africa and the rest of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the of worshiping world. According to the Pew Forum, 24% of global Christian population now live in sub-Saharan Africa, compared with 26% in Europe, 24% in Latin America and the Caribbean. 16% of the global Muslim population live in sub-Saharan Africa. Nigeria alone has the biggest Muslim population west of the Gulf, west of the Gulf. 
this means that region, the, the African region has the third biggest Muslim population on Earth after the Asia Pacific, 62%, Middle East and North Africa, 20%. And, and according to the Pew Forum, Nigeria holds the fifth largest Muslim population, as I think I mentioned, as the sixth largest Christian population of all countries in the world. Uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the fastest growing Catholic population perhaps in, in, in the world is, is in Africa. Maybe that's what informed the speculation that uh, during the last um, search for the successful to uh, Pope Benedict, they were mentioning an African. Um, uh, I don't know if I told my colleagues at RSI that I don't think it was going to happen. Uh, but maybe not now. Who knows? Who knows? I never thought in my lifetime that we'll have a Sub-Saharan African Secretary General of the UN. He has served his time and gone. So the time will come when you have to recognize that the, the, the world has to recognize that the growing Muslim population in Africa, the growing Christian population could be an advantage, a linkage, and a, another measure of interdependence. Uh, and it's not just one way, by the way. Uh, there's a uh, the, the African tele-evangelist, there's a Nigerian pen Pentecostal pastor called Enoch Adeboye that is winning converts in the Western world. So uh, believe it or not, Africa is actually exporting religion, at least our brand of religion. And I quote from what he said, Adeboye sums up the history of the redeemed church of God. I think there are branches in about 140 countries in, Af in the world now. He says, this redeemed church of God is, I quote, made in heaven, assembled in Nigeria, and exported to the world. <laughs> made in heaven, assembled in Nigeria, and exported to the world. This is, as I said, political scientists will not normally look at this, but this is very important linkages that could be used uh, positively. And then there's the demography. Pay attention. Africa's population is the fastest growing on Earth. By 2100, okay? How many more years is that from now? That's about 85. Guess what? One in every three persons on Earth will be an Africa. A third, okay? According to UN figures, the population of all Africa, including North Africa, has grown from 230 million in 1950 to 1,046 million in 2011, and is projected to surpass 2 billion by 2050. By the turn of the century, Africa's population, which in 2011 was equivalent to 61% uh, of the population of the Americas, Europe, and Oceania, taken together might, sub might surpass them by 83%. In, in the year 2100, as I say, Africa could be five times as populous as North America, and over four times more populous than either Europe or Latin America or the Caribbean. Well, there's a very interesting aside to that, by the way. Uh, Nigerians are always proud to say that one out of every five African is a Nigerian. And there was the, I, must, I can't resist this joke about Nigeria. Uh, and the ambassador will forgive me. There was a Kenyan uh, couple, wife and, uh, and, uh, and uh, husband, and as always, the pressure was on the wife to have more children, because it's believed that more children, you know, that's a blessing from the Almighty, you know. And we know historically, the more children we have, the, the more likelihood of survival, you know, and then more farm hands in traditional uh, uh, agricultural communities. So anyway, pressure on this woman. Four children, have a fifth one. <clears throat> and she said, well, I wouldn't mind having a fifth child, but how do I explain this to my Kenya husband? Because he will have to be a Nigerian. <laughs> so one out of every five <laughs> African is, uh, is a Nigerian. But, but it's not just about population itself, it's, uh, and, and, but really how within that population, how to, uh, the, the challenge of production, the challenge of employment, the, the challenge of getting them involved in the political sphere so that they don't become disillusioned, disenfranchised, and recruitment, uh, fighter graph for recruitment to do bad things, like child soldiers and so on. And that's why, in my view, the young Africans are central to the future of African Renaissance. And the African um, Union has recognized this. They have adopted uh, African Youth Charter on the 2nd of July, 2006 in Banjul, and has already entered into force that uh, provides a useful framework and policy document to promote the continued 
prioritization of youth for Africa's development. Similarly, women and African development. Uh, it's very clear that the women have played a pivotal role in Africa's socioeconomic development. Uh, they provide about half of the continent's agricultural labor force, and they manage large proportion of a small, ent small uh, business enterprises. Don't ever underrate the capacity of the African woman. I know I'm married to one. <laughs> and I used to say that people think that uh, my boss in the UN was, uh, 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 was um, Boutros Ghali, Koviana, and Ban Ki moon. The real boss uh, is Mrs. Gambari, you know. Uh, no, but very seriously, the African women, they have been at the backbone, not of just of the family, but productive, productive part of uh, the, the African economy, uh, particularly in the agriculture and small enterprises. And if we neglect the African women, then really the, the, the gains made, in my view, uh, uh, that is now moving in the direction of from Afro-pessimism to Afro-enthusiasm, in my view, will be lost. But also the uh, issue of food insecurity, I don't have time to go into that. It's very important because still a lot of Africans are going hungry, a uh, lot of malnutrition. There's no reason for that because for the most part we are fat aligned and that's why investment in agriculture is key. Again, the Africans have decided that uh, the, every African country should uh, devote at least 10% of their budget to agriculture. It should be obvious. Not, uh, not many of them have reached that target, but it's very important that they do, not just in terms of multinutrition, but also as a source of continuing uh, 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 continue engine of growth for the, for the continent are still employed, agriculture still employs uh, a lot of the higher per percentage of the people of Africa. So let me begin to come to some conclusion. I believe that in order to, um, to, to, to sustain the momentum, to, to, to underscore and, and uh, make more durable the gains being made, uh, there has to be further progress in improving political and economic governance in Africa. Um, and there are two ways in which uh, progress can be made. One is uh, through what has become very, very important now, uh, new centers of economic growth and policy uh, development in the continent. Uh, there are the so-called RECs, not W-R-E-C-K, but RECs, R-E-Cs, Regional Economic Communities. So in West Africa, you have ECOWAS, which is, is the, the um, uh, the uh, community to mobilize, to promote intra-African trade, which is still a very small percentage of Africa's total trade. It's about between 4 to 8 percent. Uh, it could be better. Then they promote uh, integration, free movements of uh, goods and services. I hold, I, when I told somebody, do you know, I hold an ECOWAS passport as a Nigerian. Yeah. So I have ECOWAS passport issued by uh, uh, Nigeria on behalf of ECOWAS. Free movement of, uh, of, uh, without visas. So the regional economic communities in Africa, one in West Africa, you have SADC in Southern Africa, you have East African community in East Africa. These are very important institutions and attention should be focused on them. Um, and I've even suggested um, unsolicited advice by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, there should be a concurrent accreditation, for example, of uh, if you have uh, an ambassador in Nigeria, we are not concurrently accredited to ECOWAS. The capital is in Abuja. Similarly, the one to Kenya, why not accredit to the East African community? Same with SADC, you know, saves money and you have bigger opportunities, bigger markets. Uh, and I hope some people would uh, listen. I won't stop talking about it until I leave Singapore. <laughs> Uh, because it's very important. And, and also get attached to African financial institutions that works. There's something called the African Development Bank, not to be confused with, it's called, uh, it used to be called ADB, but then it was confused with uh, uh, Asian Development Bank. So now they call it AFDB, <laughs> African Development uh, Bank. It's working so well that they have to struggle to maintain the African character because the so-called externals want to invest in it. It's working. But the Africans said not so fast because we, want, we don't want the funds from outside so much that it will, they will lose control. So regional economic community, African Development Bank, uh, and then of course the African Union itself, the so-called NEPAD, New Partnership for African Development, the African Peer Review Mechanism. These are those structures 
that works. Uh, it should be further developed, and the world should take a, account of them and work with them. Uh, the African peer review mechanism is uh, established to, for African uh, countries to review each other's policies, uh, political governance, corporate governance, economic governance. Now, imagine ASEAN, if they were to have ASEAN peer review mechanism, so that Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, Indonesia, for example, have to review each other. How are you doing? Are you doing well? And to criticize, not to be negative, but to help those that are not performing up to par, and, and, and then see, share the best practices, you know. Uh, so far, that mechanism is voluntary. There are only uh, 37 countries, but don't, I can't say only, 37 out of 53, not bad. But if I have a choice, I will make it compulsory for every African country to belong to the African peer review mechanism. So as, as, a, as a mechanism, an instrument, you know, uh, to, to promote better governance uh, in all these uh, areas. So let me conclude with the following observation. Despite the uh, impressive achievement in Africa's uh, social, economic, and political uh, governance and agenda, the challenge for African leaders remain how to sustain the progress achieved so far and to turn them into long-term development gains benefiting all their peoples. There is need to sustain current growth rates and relentlessly implement the institutional and policy reforms in Africa in order to ensure accelerated progress in overall human development. At the same time, Africa will not be immune from the impact of several areas of global concerns, climate change, activities of multinational terrorist networks, transnational crimes, including drug and human trafficking. African countries cannot and should not be expected to address these causes alone because global challenges require global action on the basis of global solidarity. In this context, Africa's voice must be heard loud and clear, and the continent must be adequately represented in international and intergovernmental institutions and fora in order to, find, to help find optimal, durable, and just solutions for Africa and global problems. For example, in the IMF and World Bank, Africa is grossly underrepresented. Africa was at the UN, in the Security Council, Africa is the only continent that has no permanent uh, seat in the Security Council. 53 member states, no permanent seat. On their part, African countries need to fully implement the large number of all the African Union and agreements and framework documents. This include the Constitutive Act itself, the New Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, the African Peer Review Mechanism, and uh, what I alluded to earlier, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program aimed at accelerating regional integration and advancing the creation of a common market in the continent. In this way, in my view, Africa's bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the partners, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, will also be enhanced. Also, African countries must aggressively invest in infra infrastructure and human capital. And th again, this is an area of opportunity. The Africans' need for infrastructure is immense. And if it's done, and done right, it's going to free up a lot of, uh, open up the continent to intra-African trade and, and also free up a lot of uh, for forces and opportunities that, uh, for instance, incidentally, that's what the Chinese realized. And they invested heavily in infrastructures. Some people say, oh yes, but they're only investing in infrastructure that moves um, 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 mineral resources and, uh, and uh, all, uh, all and go to, to China. Okay. When the Chinese leave, as they must leave, they're not going to take away the railways. They're not going to take the roads. They're not going to take the hydroelectric plants, would they? And by investing, they have challenged the Western countries that have previously refused to invest in infrastructures. So the coming of the Chinese uh, is not a curse. The Africans should not be seen as if they're just robots and idiots who can, who might want to substitute another colonialism, uh, one colonialism for another. They have survived, recall, they have survived slavery, survived colonialism, survived apartheid, survived HIV AIDS, a resilient continent where the, the future belongs to the youth and the women uh, of the continent, the, the, the engines of growth. They are not about to be naively deceived by anybody, but those who used to take Africa for granted now have competition. And that can only be for the overall benefit uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the continent. So I'm arguing that Africa can and will become a global pool of growth. Uh, 
And so, in conclusion, I will argue that in highlighting the positive social, economic, and political development in Africa, yes, but I've also recognized the challenges that remain. What I absolutely am arguing is that yeah, we have to change the narrative about Africa from the pessimism of the past. You know, the economists are this uh, headline one time uh, magazine, Africa, the hopeless continent, you know? Which is very naive. How can you dismiss a whole people that will be by the year 2011, one third of the human race? You are doing that to your own peril. But in any case, even they are now saying that uh, from the pessimism of the past, the, 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 there's, uh, there's a new uh, optimism about Africa. Uh, now, what I'm arguing for above all is not to move from pessimism to optimism and back, but you really to stress one thing, which is Africa's opportunity. Thank you very much for.